sensational point guard for the Fighting Tigers of LSU. Jackson has been a model of class and a perfect example of the American dream of hard work and effort to pay off. That dream continues now for Chris Jackson all the way to the NBA. the best scoring guards in the NBA. But tonight, the basketball star is benched indefinitely for not standing for the national anthem. I feel that uh, he should stand up. I mean, he's in America. He gets paid by the American company, so. That's what this country is all about. You have the right to do as you want to. I can understand his religious beliefs, but there are rules to the game, and he has to abide by the rules like everyone else. In 1993, Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf announced he was no longer Chris Jackson changing his name in accordance with his faith. But some fellow Muslims, even the man who gave this Abdul Raouf his name, are disappointed with the player's actions. I was disappointed with the news that he did not stand because that related or they connect Mahmoud to Islam. Mahmoud Abdul Raouf has been a role model and mentor for young people, and tonight they too are split on their support. I mean, America is the reason why uh, He's making the big bucks, and I mean, he should at least respect that. I feel that if that's his nature, you know, if that's where he was from, I feel that he can sit down if he wants to sit down. If he doesn't do that where he's from, I think that's how what he should do. But this is Denver, Colorado. I mean, we need to stand up for our national anthem. I used to practice all the time, and I'm working to the beat. And there's this invisible man, and wherever I dribble, he's there. And I shoot, he's right on the tip of the shot. And I'm, I'm trying to outdo this invisible man. He's as quick, if the quick, as quick as I go, he goes. And everywhere I go, there he is. And that's the way I would play the whole day. If I'm one-on-one -on -one with this invisible person. The child never crawled a day in his life. Once he was like seven months old, I said, I'd be right back. I was in the bed, right? When I got back, 
He was walking, and I just, wow. it freaked me out. I was screaming, you know? I said, what? I said, Chris is walking. This kid was different. I guess I was Mr. Mom and Mr. Dad. <laughs> My boys and me, we were something else. Mostly my mother went to work from five in the morning. And during that time is when I really found basketball. I grew up without a father. So, um, you know, I think I've always been a strong-willed person, uh, very disciplined. If, if I put my mind to something, I stick to it. And, you know, basketball became a way for, uh, uh, it became that father figure that I never had. So that's why, I mean, I would always just, to take, you know, take my mind off of that, I would always spend my time just playing basketball. And from there on, the love grew, and I just kept playing. And I was that determined at that age, being 10 years old, that I want to be a professional basketball player, and nothing is going to discourage me. Growing up in the conditions that we grew up in, we had to grow up real fast. My mother, having to work and raise three children. And in that environment where you have drugs, you have prostitution, you right up the next street, and she's gone and we're there basically to ourselves. That was real hard. And during that time, I can remember the KKK marching. I've always had a, when I was early, uh, when I was younger, I always prayed a lot. Uh, for God to bless me. Oh, my. To be able to take care of my family. I would spend hours just thinking about I have to take care of my brothers. This is the only way out for us. This is the only way out that I had. You know, it was just not a game for me. It was a way out. You know, some kids nowadays, they play it and it's just a game, it's fun. But it wasn't always fun for me. I was tired because I would put so much energy and effort. I mean, I would leave the court almost breathless. Was always out there with that ball. Never did do no homework. He would come in, he would sit down and eat. Put the ball right there by the table. So what is what is with this ball? This this was me. This is my reaction. You about to drive me crazy with this ball sitting down here by the by the bed? And he gets through eating. He'll get up. He'll take the ball and he'll leave. He go get in the tub. He got the ball. Jesus. So I never thought nothing about the ball. I say just love a ball. That's it. I may have worked out for two hours, just constantly with this invisible person. I may say, okay, I have 10 shots. I just want to make 10 shots. But in my mind, it has to be all net. And they're just not like free throw shooting. Where you just shoot and you're just standing still. These were in full motion. And I'm already tired because I've probably worked out two hours and he can't breathe. So I'm out there, I'm breathing hard, I'm working, and I'm shooting. Uh, and if I'm dribbling, for some reason, if I'm dribbling, even if it went net, if I, re if, 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 if I recall that it didn't it come off my hands right, I got to go back. When I first noticed my son had, uh, what you call it? Tourette's. Tourette's. He would really actually just irritate me, right? Open, open, closing, open, closing the refrigerator door, open. I was just shut the door and let it be. And then he'll tie his shoes and he'll take them and unlace them and tie them again. I said, you're driving me nuts. I didn't know he had that problem. And once I realized it, mm -hmm. it made me cry. I cried a many days. I said, I'm hollering at my son for something he couldn't control. Tourette's syndrome is a neurological disorder. It's obsessive compulsive. Constantly want to do things over and over. And it causes a lot of tics. When I was in high school or junior high, looking in front of a mirror, and I was fixing my hair or something, and I was moving, and I was popping my neck, pop, 
I mean, I was really popping my neck and I was making sounds and I was doing it like, popping it like this way, real hard, pow. And I was moving my hips and jerking my body. And I'm looking at myself. I'm like, why can't I stop? I kept looking at myself and I started sweating and I started crying and I'm looking at myself and I'm praying and I'm looking at myself. I'm like, why can't I stop? And I'm like, look at me, please, please, God, help me stop. It was a serious relief for me, my 11th grade year, to find out that what I had, other people I had, that I wasn't the only one. And I said, wow, okay, Tourette's. Then the next thing was, okay, how do I get rid of it? You can't. There's no cure yet. It's hereditary. Okay. No problem. Well, at least I know I'm not the only one. But it's a blessing because it keeps you always humble. You can't entertain the thought that you the man and that you're perfect. I went to see him play at Gulfport High. And I'm sitting on the wrong side. I'm cheering for the wrong team, okay? <laughs> know the difference. <laughs> But, listen, why are you cheering for this side? That's the side you need to be cheering for, the admirals. And when he jumped up, to me it was like 12 foot. He was surrounded by every last one of them, every last one of them. I'm sitting there, I'm praying to God. I'm having my fingers crossed and everything. This kid kept bouncing that ball and went through their legs. And I said, Lord, holy Jesus. <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't believe it. He went through all of those guys legs and still bounced that ball and still made that hoop. Uh, so I was recruited early. Uh, they were watching me. I made up my mind early that I wanted to go to LSU. For the third game, I come out and I'm playing against Louisiana Tech. I knew I was scoring, but I didn't have an idea. At the end of the game, I get back to the locker room and it was Vernell Singleton and our roommate. And Vern's like, man, you just scored 48 points. We fly to Florida. Number one team in the nation, I believe, at the time. We're in their house, jam-packed. Not only did we beat them, but I scored 53 points. And after the game, I come back out to be an interview. They give me a standing ovation. And after the game, coach is just, you score 53, you score 53. I'm calm down, man, calm down, calm down. Things don't happen like that in neighborhoods I'm from. You know, the, that fast and that good. And what happened at LSU was almost identical to what happened in high school. But one year I averaged 30.2. My first year in college, 30.2. I'm doing the same thing I grew up doing on the playground. Same crossover move, same fake, same quick jump shot. I'm, I haven't changed a thing, and the same thing is working. My decision to go pro was primarily because I was concerned about my family. I remember going home on one trip. I looked into the refrigerator, and I didn't see hardly anything. I went into the bathroom, and I was washing my hands, and I put my forearms on the sink, and it fell to the floor. The sink? I, yeah, and I came out, and I remember saying, the hell with this. And my mama was in, in, the, in the kitchen sitting. I said, hell with this, I'm gone. I'm leaving, I'm going pro, that's it. I don't, and she was, she was sitting like this, real sad. I said, I'm out of here, I'm gone, I'm, I'm leaving. And that, that was when I made up my mind. Uh, the day of the draft, I heard that I was gonna be top three. And finally, you know, I heard Denver Nuggets choose Chris Jackson. Jackson has been a perfect example of the American dream of hard work and effort paying off. That dream continues now for Chris Jackson all the way to the NBA.
There was a lot of excitement at the time about him coming. Here's Chris Jackson, the guy who was, you know, the next Pete Maravich. Um, but I think there was also skepticism, too. 6-1 for an NBA player is, is pretty short. You know, can he score like that in the NBA? When you saw him play, that's when you realized how special he was. He not only could shoot well, but he had probably the quickest um, first step or the quickest head fake I've ever seen. He had an incredible shot where he could shoot from, from anywhere. The thing that stood out was the quickness and his ability to shake a guy and get off his shot. He's an incredible athlete, phenomenal. You have to be that if you're gonna be 6'1". When I was in Denver, I still had, I would put crosses on my tennis shoes. I would have one in my shorts, you know, because I was, I was searching. I would listen to, at times, late at night, evangelists. How I was really questioning the, the validity. I just, I, I was turned off. Wow. I said, it, something's wrong. Yeah. It, it isn't, something's not, to me, something's not right. When I was at LSU, but I remember receiving the autobiography of Malcolm X. That's the first book I really enjoyed. It's not the first book I completed. The Quran was, was the first one I, man, I, I enjoyed this one. It touched me. When he, when he got to the point to where when he went to Hodge, he met all different cultures, drank from the same cup, and how he realized that what he was being taught wasn't correct. I said, this is what I'm looking for, this is it. When I was on the pilgrimage, I had close contact with Muslims whose skin would, in America, be classified as white, and with Muslims who themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and- The major thing that touched me about Malcolm's autobiography was that he transcended his environment, never truly being educated, and then educating himself in prison. That, that fascinated me more than anything. When I was in Denver, I was in contact with this priest and his protege, and we would talk from time to time, and the word Islam came up. And he said, if, if I was interested, I'd go to the masjid on Evans Street. Went there, and we were nervous, because I didn't know anything about Muslims. You know. uh -huh. so, you know, I was stuttering, can we, you know, somebody said we can come up here and get the Quran. He said, sure. Very nice, brother, I don't remember his name. We went in, he gave it to us. And I remember him talking to him, but I couldn't remember anything he, he was saying because my thing was I wanted to go home and read it myself. Uh -huh. So I'm listening to him, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but I had it. I wanted to go home. So we got in the car, we rushed home. So, I mean, we got in, as soon as we got in, we didn't say anything to each other. I put the book down, he was here. I opened up the, uh, the Quran, I, I just opened it. And I read, we were in our own little world, I was reading. I read another page. It was about two or three pages. I looked, I looked up, and I had almost like water in my eyes. I said, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna be a Muslim. And he looked, he said, I'm gonna be one too. And from then on, I just started reading, asking questions. It's a brother who was there, who was like the janitor. You know, he would teach me certain things. And eventually, I think August 22nd, either after I came back from one of those rookie seminars or before, I embraced Islam. Everybody got their own beliefs, and but it took me a while to accept it. You know, it's like other people, they used to call and say, well, why would he change his name? His, he, he's a household. Chris Jackson is a house, how did you say that? Household name. Household name, so how are we gonna get used to, how are we gonna get used to saying Mahmoud Abdul Raouf? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm getting used to it, and I certainly can't spell it right now. <laughs> A lot of times on a team, there's a tendency for the guys to talk about what they did last night, you know, with women. I dated a lot. That had to change. It was a slow process. You know, I'm not one to say once I became Muslim, I was on the straight and narrow right away. But I found myself becoming a more globally aware and concerned and, and active. 
That's the major thing that, that has changed in my life after becoming Muslim. Growing up, he was always a nice guy. But when he became Muslim, when he accepted the religion of Islam, you can see the change in the man. And I saw that change, which drew me to him that much more as we got older. Because like I said, I knew him growing up. But to see him as a man, as a Muslim man, when I knew him as Chris Jackson growing up, it's a definite change in the way he does everything. My playing basketball, I think it made my transition to Islam easier because Islam demands that same type of energy and effort and perfection in whatever you do. I think God was molding me for this. Remember, I was waking up consistently in the summer at 5 o'clock in the morning to go play. Same time, pretty much, we have to wake up to pray. And I would always keep in mind where I got these abilities from, praying to God, thanking God, not just your prayers and your studies, but everything can be an act of worship if you do it with the consciousness of pleasing God. Nuggets star Mahmoud abdul Rauf, who practiced with the team this afternoon, was suspended just 20 minutes before game time for violating his contract by refusing to stand for the national anthem. abdul Rauf also says he's opposed to standing for the flag, which many here consider a symbol of freedom. It's also a, a symbol of oppression, uh, of tyranny. The Nuggets star converted to the Islam faith in 1991. Two years later, he legally changed his name from Chris Jackson to Mahmoud abdul Rauf, which means elegant and praiseworthy, most merciful, most kind. He says Muslims don't honor any nationalistic ideology, something his former college teammate, Shaquille O'Neal, whose father is Muslim, understands. Muslims have different beliefs and they have different anthems. I mean, and, you know, uh, you just have to respect that. He didn't just start doing it. I mean, he's been a Muslim for three years, and I've, I've seen him not honor the national anthem for two years, so I don't know how they evolved around, you know, suspending him when they did. Mahmoud had not been standing for the flag at the end of the previous season. He would be in the uh, locker room, he would be in the hallway, he would wait until the national anthem uh, was completed, and then he would uh, silently, uh, without any um, fanfare, just walk onto the court, and uh, they would announce the starting lineups and he would be there and just play basketball. And as, as the next season came along, uh, I think it had been about, um, oh, it must have been about 30, 35 games that he had not been standing for the national anthem the previous, uh, the, the uh, next season. What caused me not to stand was just my Muslim conscience uh, and, and what I understood and what I understand now. Uh, I couldn't see myself knowing the relationship that the United States government had and has with what's going on in the world, with starvation, with wars, with economical strangulation, with all of these things, I could not see myself as an individual stand for a symbol that represented that. We're getting ready to play Orlando. The trainer comes out, Mahmoud, Bernie wants to see you. I go down to his office. They were trying to convince me to stay in. And they give me an example. We're Jewish, for example. I said, well, I'm not Jewish. I'm Muslim. And I'm not standing. He said, well, they're, they're going to find you. So let them find me. They're going to suspend you. Let them suspend me. I'm not going to stand. You know, I like all my players to line up and, and be attentive as a sign of respect. What's wrong with that guy? He signed on the dotted line. That's the rules of the game. I don't necessarily agree with what he's saying, but I respect his uh, freedom to, to express himself. The lead should, had nothing to do with that. They, that was way too tough. I called the NBA official, and I asked him, was this a rule where he has to stand? And he said, well, I don't know if it's being a rule. He's expected to stand. And he could not tell me that it was indeed a rule or not a rule. Finally, somebody, an athlete, somebody who's um, making a lot of money, standing up for what he believes in, um, and we just don't see a lot of that these days. You look back in the 1960s, you had Muhammad Ali not boxing for three years because of his religious beliefs. You've seen some uh, Jewish athletes 
um, not wanting to participate um, during religious holidays. The difference this time was that, you know, it was all wrapped in the American flag. There's a little article in the paper. The media grabbed that. That's when they came to me. And then I spoke my Muslim conscience. I didn't hold back. I wasn't trying to be a big guy. I wasn't trying to get any publicity. Actually, I didn't think it was a big deal. I was made out to be a villain. They were trying to stereotype me like they stereotype a lot of other Muslims. I think it's an insult to all of the uh, people that fought in the war and things like that, and it's an insult to America. I respect the fact that a man has principle. I may not agree with his statement, but that's the irony of our freedom of speech, that he can say something I don't like. Ask Mahmoud if he'd rather not get paid in American dollars. They assassinated my character. It became an issue of money. Well, I remember the question was posed to me, how can you be oppressed making two million a year? I said, some people are given that type of money to keep their mouths shut. I said, I grew up with Tourette's syndrome. I grew up in the ghetto. I grew up knowing what it was like not to have medical care. I said, are you to tell me I'm not to feel that? They never aired that. I received death threats. Two garbage bags full of hate mail, you know, telling me to go back to Africa. I think he should do the pledge. He is playing on an all-American team, and I think he should abide by the rules. Well, it's his constitutional right to do what he wants. If he doesn't believe in it, then he shouldn't have to stand up. You know, if he's uh, defying the NBA, then he has to also get punished for it. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America does not vote for black people. I'm a Baptist, he's a Muslim. We still got black kids dying, and he's a black male that people look up to, and I'm just glad your brother took a stand. This is a belief, and I won't compromise my beliefs. There were other people that came out and said, well, I'm trying to get Mahmoud to talk with the NBA officials. I'm trying to get Mahmoud to take this stance or that stance. Um, and these people had never not only talked to Mahmoud, but they hadn't talked to me. They didn't know anything about the intricacies or, uh, or what actually was going on behind the scenes. They just showed up when the camera was turned on and um, injected them themselves as leaders. Um, Pop-ups is what we call them. Professor Sharif Bassione says this is not about Islam. To claim that there is anything in the Islamic religion uh, that would be incompatible with honoring one's national flag, national anthem, or national obligations is absolutely absurd. I was more shocked by the immigrant response than I was the African-American Christian or the white Americans. Reporters were interviewing immigrant Muslims. They outraged me to the point of no return. The disagreement with uh, Abdul Rauf suddenly bringing out of the blue the issue which does not really represent any uh, value issues for our community at large. The basic principles of democracy go in hand with the Islamic principles. It, it made the media question our patriotism, question our sincerity of being Americans. Islamic teachings is you worship none but God, but you respect the flag. You respect the, you know, you know, the honor of America. To not stand behind this young man, who was certainly standing on, for him, an Islamic principle, okay, which is I don't pledge allegiance to anybody or anything but God, was so absurd. This was not a young man who had no skills and was just riding on some coattail. This was a young man who had demonstrable skills, you know. And that we as a community, a Muslim community, not just an African-American community, should have made sure, like other communities will, when you try to attack one of their own, no, you won't do this. We don't have to agree with him. Irrelevant. When Muslims came out and went against what I did, 
I was disappointed because not that I was looking for anything, I wasn't. But once it happened, I said, wow. I said, this can be something that unite us, that bring us together. And that's what I was hoping for. So well, we understand, hey, we only stand for Allah. We believe in Allah. You know, this is, this is the principle. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of conforming to, of agreeing with, of adhering to, of worshiping, whether it's in the person, it's in a symbol, but Allah is very simple. We say it every day. We're gonna, we're gonna unify. And when I heard this, first thing I thought of, and, and I always have to be honest, so these are apologetic Muslims. I understand, of course, the, uh, the uh, uh, temptation to be apologetic and embarrassed when you feel threatened, when you feel that society is ready to pounce on you and target you simply because you're, you're a Muslim, the natural inclination is to try to allay their fears. To, the natural inclination is to say, I'm not a threat to you, I'm, I'm one of you. Throughout the 20th century, Muslims have been in an identity crisis. We have tended to define Islam in reaction to Westernism. You are either pro-Western, so, you know, basically you study what the West has and you say, oh, you know, democracy is good. Islam is more democratic than democracy. Oh, constitutionalism is good. Islam is more constitution, you know, has a stronger tradition of constitutionalism. Or you do exactly the opposite. So you basically look at what the West has and define Islam as exactly the opposite. It is simply a political reaction depending on whether you tend to be pro-Western or more anti-Western. As an immigrant, can you be a Westerner? Or are you destined to be simply an Easterner who lives in the West? If you're an indigenous Muslim, can you acknowledge the Western component of your black American identity? Or are you, as a Muslim, destined to repress, marginalize, and play down that Western component and always see yourself as a sort of displaced Easterner? You have Islam among Americans, black and white, prior to the coming of the immigrants. In the black American community, the meaning of being a Muslim was really relatively simple. People went from womanizing and drinking and drugs and crime to no womanizing, no drugs, no drinking, no crime. When the immigrants came over, they were assumed to know the Quran, to know Islamic law, and because they were assumed to know that, they were empowered to define what it meant to be a Muslim in America and what the Muslim agenda should be. These people's two different histories explain their different reactions to this whole issue of Mahmoud Abdul Rauf's not standing. This is where the two communities just could not see eye to eye. People born here, Muslims, black American and white American, saw nothing un-Islamic about his not standing and nothing un-American about his not standing. This is what the immigrants don't understand about America because they're coming from totalitarian governments. They're coming from governments where there is no uh, history of dissent and if it is, it's ruthlessly oppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, any immigrant community is afraid to voice dissent. There are many of the Muslim immigrants who have migrated to this country because they wanted a better life for themselves or their children. And the fact that they've done that to dissent once they get here is a little frightening. We haven't had an issue of uh, um, Egyptians or, or, or Saudis or Pakistanis refusing to salute their national flag or stand up in their national anthem. If you refuse to stand up in the national anthem of Saudi Arabia, the likelihood that you'll be executed or put away in prison for <laughs> a very long time. 
Here in the United States, we can do that. So not to stand for the flag or for the national anthem is a form of speech. And this, not only does Islam honor freedom of speech as long as it's consistent with the rules of Islam, it also uh, is congruous with the, the dominant culture here. In other words, the dominant culture here honors freedom of speech and says that he has a right to dissent. Now when the Jehovah's Witness have done that, and there are Jehovah's Witness basketball players who refuse to stand for the national anthem, nobody uh, mentioned them. Nobody, uh, this didn't become a big news story, but the fact that he was uh, a black man and a Muslim, there's a double combination. We've got a problem here. Women want to change certain things. Gays want to change certain things. Christians want to change certain things, as long as they do it through legislative means that are peaceful and legal. That's America. But people seem to be saying that, no, no, no. Muslims threaten our American way of life. Muslims shouldn't even be allowed to change things peacefully and legally. That is very un-American. As new people convert and read the text and find out that, I mean, there is a, a Quranic worldview, which has an emphasis here, they're going to stand for what's right. To a large segment of this country and of other people around the world, that flag does not represent freedom, justice, liberty for all. It doesn't represent that. It represents something quite different. It represents oppression. It represents tyranny. It represents, I and mean, this is real, and you, we can't deny that. That's what that flag represents. It's burnt in a lot of places on this planet, not just in Muslim countries, in, in, uh, in non-Muslim countries. They see America as a, as a totalitarian uh, empire and totalitarian not within, inside its, its uh, borders, but outside its borders, because it imposes totalitarian governments on other peoples and supports them and arms them. It's also a, a symbol of oppression, uh, of tyranny. The main two words they kept using, oppression and tyranny, tyranny and oppression, they never would highlight, but hold on, he did say, wherever the injustice is, even if it's in Saudi Arabia, as Muslims, we do not stand for it. And that's why I didn't stand. It's a holy day of worship, but yesterday morning, shortly after morning prayer, worshipers heard music pumping through their sound system. Disc jockeys at KBPI turned this mosque here on South Parker Road into a charade, playing the national anthem entering the holy place wearing shoes and trying to goad members of the mosque into joining in. The mosque has had an open door policy, but now that may change. Police investigating the case say the incident goes beyond a prank. Well, I believe that there's probably a crime that's been committed, although we are still in the process of evaluating that. The stunt was apparently a play on Nuggets forward Mahmoud Abdul Rauf's resistance to stand during the national anthem. KBPI's Joey Tian and the others involved in the incident can't be charged with ethnic intimidation because there was no threat. But the KBPI employees involved in the prank have been suspended without pay. After a stunt that included playing the national anthem, disc jockeys at KBPI make a public apology for a stunt that drew criticism from people of all faiths. I felt very awkward coming here, but then immediately upon meeting the people, I felt very relaxed. There was also hope that today's gathering would help dispel myths about the Muslim faith. I think we wanted to come here as soon as we heard the open house was here because I, I think there's so much uh, talk lately about Muslims, about the Islamic Center, but I don't personally know a tremendous amount about it. So this is a great opportunity just to come and to hear from them directly what they believe. Well, Muslims believe a lot of things, but what Muslims believe that makes them Muslims is the oneness of God, five pillars of Islam, and then the basic moral principles of Islam, you know, charity, you know, don't steal, don't lie, don't hurt people's feelings. The prophet told people not to stand as a way of exalting something. Standing is for Allah. The day they stand for God. There's a famous story. The Khalifa entered in and everybody stood up in the mosque for the, the ruler of the Muslims, except this scholar. And, and they asked him why he didn't stand. And he said, because I thought about the verse that said, on the day when they stand for the Lord of the worlds. And I felt ashamed. 
to stand for this secular, worldly ruler. The Prophet Muhammad said that the greatest struggle is to speak the truth in front of an unjust power. With a situation like Mahmoud Abd al-Rauf uh, refusing to stand up uh, to the flag, he was acting as a good American. Allah tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuha ladhin aminu kunu qawwa min al-bilqist, shuhada lillah, O you have attained the faith, be ever steadfast in upholding justice, bearing witness to the truth for the sake of Allah. Not for the sake of just the Muslims, not for the sake of, of, of just the Christians or the Jews, but, and, uh, and don't stand up for justice just for yourself. No, this is a broad statement. Justice is justice. I'm not here to talk, I'm here to play basketball. If you wanna ask me about basketball, I'll talk about basketball. All I can say is he's back and uh, we're big enough to move on. The Nuggets hit the road with Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. The standoff about standing, the NBA won. Raouf will stand not to honor the flag, the Muslim will pray to his God. Reports say Muslim basketball stars Akeem Olajuwon and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar helped convince Raouf to change his position. But the guards' belief that the American flag represents, among other things, oppression and tyranny is unchanged. Expect Raouf's reception to be rather hostile. He hasn't admitted to making a mistake. He's just settled for a compromise. The suspension only lasted for a game. I decided to come back to the league uh, to stand because I spoke to a brother who enlightened me about what the Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, did when a Jewish funeral was passing by, he stood up and they said, why are you standing? He says, I'm not standing for that cause. I'm standing because Allah gave a life and he took a life away. So he said, you can stand, but it doesn't mean that you have to stand for that cause. And I heard, I said, wow, the prophet did that. So, okay. And that eased my pain. So I started making a dua, a prayer for the oppressed, for people struggling, all of that, when I would stand. I'll be looking to see what prayer he gonna sing so I can say the same prayer he said. And I'm glad that he's back to standing. Whatever he does, if he wants to pray or whatever, I feel uh, he needs to stand. I don't think they should play the national anthem at any sporting event. You know, then we wouldn't have this problem. When I didn't stand for the flag, I said, yeah, I got traded to, to Sacramento. You knew right away that a line had been stepped over. This is probably not going to last for Mahmoud. He needs to be moved because the NBA um, would look at that as in, ter in business terms. You know, we're trying to sell a product here. Let's try to make this disappear and move on. When I got traded to Sacramento, they didn't play me much the first year. Uh, and the second year, they played me even less. And a lot of games, I didn't even see the court, did not play. They had DNP, did not play because of coach's decision. And never have I really gotten those. Usually people would come to me because of what I did in Denver. Numbers I put up, leading the team in scoring four years in a row, assists four years in a row. They would come to me, why aren't you playing? Well, that year, no one even approached. I can penetrate. You don't need to set a pick for me to get my shot. I can, get my, I can go get my shot myself on a big guy, small guy, but these guys can't get their shots off like I. How in the world are they getting picked up and I can't get picked up? I said, I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to blackball me. 2000, 2001 is when I was picked up by the Vancouver Grizzlies. The same thing happened. They would even say, man, he's dominating practice. They never really played me in the games. Now that I'm trying to resign, no one wants to touch me. Even though when I came back this year, I was number one in the league for points per minute. When I got in, the minutes I played, I scored almost a point a minute. I was productive. So now, I said, I'll go play overseas, you know, because it's obvious. So that's, uh, I don't know how I got there, 
but I got here somehow. What corporation wants to have a player hawk their products who is controversial? There aren't any. Maybe Mahmoud is sort of a warning. Maybe all these athletes come up, I'm not going to do that. Look what happened to this guy. All I know, there's a bunch of athletes out there who make a lot of money who, you know, aren't, aren't saying a peep about anything. You know, the, the thing I, I, um, I like about Mahmoud is um, he's always real. We walking down the street and he'll say, hey, man, you see that guy over there? Some guy is uh, homeless, just sitting down. Uh, he'll say, hey, do me a favor. He said, just do me this favor. And I said, what's that? He said, go in the, go in the restaurant. He said, get him a hamburger. Go in and get him a hamburger. He said, I'm going to step over here. Just get him a hamburger and just give it to him and uh, let's walk away. That is Mahmoud. That's Mahmoud. Not the flag, not the jump shots, not the crossover dribble, not the Tourette's. That's Mahmoud. I wanted to buy this home, and I wanted to fix it up. I mean, keep it the way it looked, fix up the insides, make it all green. I was going to live here for a while, just to be in the community, you know, like I'm doing now, to be involved with the youth. But he didn't want to sell it. <laughs> he didn't want to sell it to me. So, yeah. I really didn't want him back in this community. I really didn't. I don't know. I just saw. Uh, just would like to see him somewhere else and doing better. I came back to Gulfport. Uh, this was my way of wanting to give back. I'm saying, why not give what I think is the best? Mahmoud's not getting resigned and then returning to Mississippi and shutting down a crack house and converting into a, to a mosque and then becoming the imam of a Muslim community. That's a bittersweet ending. Islam came to the autos, but it didn't come to autobiased people. I believe that African American Muslims were able to keep their own culture. Uh, we have a mixed community, even though we're in the ghetto. We have a good mixture of, of African Americans and immigrant Muslims coming. The interracial marriages that you see, you know, you see this a lot of times in the Muslim community. That's remarkable to me. Islam, what I see, is not a color thing. It's, it's about character and piety. The bottom line question, can you be Muslim and Western? The answer is definitely, because the antithesis of Islam is to deny God. It's not the West. The antithesis of West is East. Investigators are claiming arson in the early morning blaze at the home of Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. The house, which was under construction, was significantly damaged. However, no one was injured. Abdul Rauf, who was formerly known as Chris Jackson, returned to his hometown of Gulfport in 1998. He is currently a leader in the local Muslim community. Abdul Rauf believes the fire was racially motivated claiming he found graffiti spelling out the letters KKK on his property. There's some definite parallels between the way Muslims were singled out when I didn't stand for the flag and now after 9-11. Muslims are being questioned, you know, about their patriotism, uh, about their love for America. But you know, when, when I hear that, mm. it, the, the, first, the first question that pops into my mind is first, what is an American?
black bar. La ilaha illallah. I'm trying to through my character, through through my speech. I try to just live his life. Before they eat, before they do anything, before we go, we pray, before we drive. So they see that, you know, so it's not something that's alien to them. They say, man, this is normal in my house. And we hear this language all the time. We see it all the time. You know, I want them to keep that on. You don't have nothing to be afraid of. But sometimes, you know, you may give salam, salam like out in public. And you may sense, you know, like, people look apprehensive, you know, don't want to give it for whatever reason. Kids, they can be anywhere. Salam alaikum, daddy. Salam alaikum. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> <laughs>